Lectures were Mark Showalter, right there, and Dr. Jonathan Spindel. <coughs> so the goal of our project was to create an exoskeleton that could be made um, inexpensively from materials you could find at a local hardware store or an online retailer. And in addition to this, also create a guide for someone to be able to reproduce this at their home and modify it. So here's a brief overview of our presentation. Um, we'll be going through some history. We'll be going through how exoskeletons have come into the picture. We also will be going through about how exoskeletons have affected our culture today and how they might affect our culture in the future. We will then shift to our progress into constructing the exoskeleton you can see here. And we will give a um, small demonstration with it. So nowadays, exoskeletons have come more into the picture. And you see them in movies, video games, everywhere. Many people imagine them as these like super like soldier suits where they're running around, jumping, shooting rockets like Iron Man. But they aren't that right now. Right now, many people, even at their homes, are building exoskeletons, and they are much more feasible than you may imagine. So I'm going to take a moment to speak with you about the history and the various stakeholders behind exoskeleton technology. So there's a long history of exoskeletons, longer than one might think. Uh, the first example we have found was in the 1890s with the Yagen running aid which operated on a uh, tensioned steel spring, which allowed runners to uh, increase their endurance and run longer distances with, li with less stress. Unfortunately, uh, further use outside of the patent stage is unknown. Moving on to the 20th century, we have two diverging purposes of exoskeleton technology. In the 1960s, there were experiments made by GE and the US military uh, for an exoskeleton called the Hardy Man which was meant for general usage, and it was to increase the user's strength to help them lift and manipulate heavy objects. In a similar vein, in the 1970s, there was the Yugoslavian Mihailo Pupin Institute, lower extremity exoskeleton, which was meant for uh, medical and rehabilitative purposes in order to uh, restore mobility. Finally, uh, what is considered sort of the top of the line, general, uh, most accessible exoskeleton on the market. We have the HAL exoskeleton developed in Japan. It operates on a combination of muscle impulses and electronic servo motors, and it costs around $14,000 to $19,000. With the growth of exoskeleton technology within recent years, there's also been a growing do-it-yourself movement. Uh, in order to make similar assistive devices on a lower budget and with more variety of materials and uh, actuations. Our examples include the home exoskeleton competition which used a combination of steel bars and pneumatic cylinders in order to create a frame. There's the YouTube users, the Hacksmith, which initially inspired our project using uh, rebar and multiple pneumatic cylinders and then there's also the Teslonian tension-based exoskeleton using high-tension steel wire and winches in order to provide better lift. So the, base, the basic idea of an exoskeleton is to enhance or increase the user's ability far beyond their uh, natural capabilities. So in industry, it's currently already in use in the Korea Daewoo Shipworks where <coughs> A passive exoskeleton such as this allows users to uh, better carry the weight and it focuses the weight on better parts of the body. So wearing something like this, which is around 60 pounds, you could lift a 150 pound object and would feel about like 50 pounds. And with these exoskeletons, it is more likely to reduce fatigue and injury and allows for more mobility in the average worker. In a similar vein, the military is also interested in exoskeleton technologies. As mentioned before, they have been working on one exoskeleton or another since the 1960s. The most recent example is the uh, Hulk frame, or the Human Universal Load Carrier frame, which is capable of carrying about 200 pounds at a speed of 10 miles an hour for extended periods of time. This would increase the strength of the individual soldier as well as their combat effectiveness. 
Now, taking a bit of a left turn from um, industry and the military, we have the medical field, which uses exoskeletons as a means for physical therapy and rehabilitation. So examples such as the rewalk can do anything from help stabilize limb movement during recovery stages or may even increase or allow increased mobility for people suffering from paralysis. And finally, again, we have the DIY community, which has in recent years launched several projects related to the development and shared discussion of exoskeleton technologies. Our first example is the Open Exo, which was created by a user who was looking for advice on how to apply medical devices such as leg braces in order to create an exoskeleton for his mother who was suffering from multiple sclerosis. And for our project in particular, we use the model of the RepRap 3D printer. And the uh, core idea behind the RepRap was to provide a baseline model of a 3D printer that people can use and follow, and then they would be free to change or modify it at, as they please. And the website would provide them with a forum in order to better discuss and show off their various improvements. So with all these different stakeholders and growing industries, we begin to wonder how might this affect public policy in our day-to-day -day life? First example that comes to mind that I think is relevant is Oscar Pistorius, who was an Olympic gold medal winner during the 2004 Olympics. There was much controversy about him winning this gold medal because while he has prosthetics, it brings up the question is, should he be allowed to compete with these prosthetics since prosthetics do not suffer from getting like fatigued like a real muscle would? Was this instead an advantage even though he didn't have any legs? And this brings up the question for exoskeletons. If people start to having to use exoskeletons to function in their day-to-day -day life, how might this affect them? Will they be allowed to compete in athletic competitions with everyone else? Or will the exoskeleton give them such augmented abilities they won't be able to fairly compete with them? Now with legislation. Legislation often follows way behind much technology. The big best case of this recently is the drones. So when drones were first created and kind of come into the mainstream recently, they were being flown around everywhere. People were using them for, top, for photography, they were using them at sports events, they were going racing with them. They were everywhere. They were on university campuses, government property, and public areas. This began to bring a almost saturation of drones in the area, and this led to accidents. And when these accidents start to occur in these public areas and other areas, the government began to look at this as a possible security risk. So, to address this, the FAA now requires registration of all drones purchased. And with exoskeletons being newly developed and a newly coming technology, this brings a question, will people have to register exoskeletons and how will you do that? People will have medical exoskeletons, people will build exoskeletons at home. Do you have to register exoskeletons you have at home? Which brings it to the question of national security. National security, could exoskeletons be used as a weapon? Exoskeletons enhance the human ability, expand what they can do, give them enhanced strength, be able to do things that a normal person wasn't able to do before. And, in another note, with this, how would people be able to determine the difference between like, a medical exoskeleton and one someone might have weaponized? And would this lead to people who use these rehabilitative devices maybe having to go through extra security or may not even be allowed on flights? And there is some legislation for exoskeletons. Recently, the FDA approved the development of an exoskeleton prototype at the Veterans Affairs Office in the Bronx. This begins to make us think, if these exoskeletons start getting FDA approval and start getting used in the public light, will they have to make amendments to the Americans with Disabilities Act? Will they have to make special accommodations that weren't there before for exoskeletons? Right now, exoskeletons, medical ones, like the ones you may see in the Bronx, can be <coughs> multiple thousands of dollars, and they are very, very expensive. And some people may be in parts of the world that don't have access to them. This leads to the rise of people building exoskeletons at home to meet a need. 
And in our case, we were interested in exoskeleton technology. This started in IEEE, which is a technology club on JMU's campus. And this was during a Kickstarter night that we were talking about ideas that we could do. And Ben had recently watched a YouTube video by the Hacksmith where he had created an exoskeleton from bar stock and pneumatic cylinders he had just bought from a hardware store. And we were interested in it. So we started with just drawing out the design. We bought parts from a local hardware store and we put together our exoskeleton. This was a big inspiration for why we wanted to do a DIY exoskeleton and to provide a guide for people to be able to base off of our model and build upon it. Now initially we used the pneumatic cylinder. Pneumatic cylinder, we had looked at servo motors and they were a bit expensive for our budget at the time. And the pneumatic cylinder felt a bit clunky. So we found the McKibben actuator, also known as the pneumatic air muscle. These are made of latex tubing and nylon sheathing. They are very inexpensive to create. You can find these materials at almost any hardware store. And they are held together with zip ties. And they are able to contract like a real human muscle, which you will get to see later. And when they are inflated, they will contract. So here's an, one of our pneumatic air muscles, one of our smaller ones. Take note that we are using bigger ones on our frame. So when it came to using the exoskeleton, and being able to create a guide for people, it was important that we were able to test this to know its capabilities. The test we wanted to perform, though we didn't have enough time, would be tests on different dimensions of air muscles, displacement versus load versus pressure, and a variety of other variables and modifications that people could do to tailor to their purpose. So someone who was building an exoskeleton for maybe someone who was disabled at their house would not want to use the same stuff as someone who was building an exoskeleton for an industrial context. So, we did get a few tests though. The first test we did was a displacement test where we set the air muscle um, at 40 PSI and we applied um, increments of weight and saw how much it would displace. Um, what we learned from this was that it was relatively linear when it came to adding more weight to the exoskeleton and its displacement going down. And it ends at 30 pounds which was one of these smaller exoskeleton um, pneumatic, so, or not pneumatic, sorry, pneumatic muscles. The next test we did was without load, and it was just the pneumatic um, air muscles at different PSIs to see how different PSIs would affect how much it contracts. With this graph, you can see we have different lengths of air muscles. You can see we have a 13 inch without a bolt. We have a 13 inch with a bolt, which was the fastening we used on the end. We decided not to use the bolt because at higher PSI, it could come a projectile, and we want to eliminate that. Yeah. So, we also have the six inch. And what you notice from this is that after 30 PSI, this was for these smaller air muscles, that there was no actuation. But at 40 PSI, it would actuate. And from 40 PSI going on, it was a slow level curve, or not curve, um, line. So with the new air muscles, we realized that our previous wooden frame wasn't going to be enough. So we set about creating a new one that would better fit both the McKibben actuators and a general person, obviously. Uh, wood wasn't going to help. So we started by getting an Alice backpack frame. This is military surplus. It's meant to uh, it's meant for hikers or personnel to sort of carry heavier weights on their back and would put uh, the weight and pressure on their hips where they're better able to carry it. So using that as a uh, sort of base for our new models, we began to uh, brainstorm and create various sample models out of uh, <laughs> paper rivets and cardstock. So we have two here. These were the two sort of final stages of the heat brainstorming stages. And we ended up uh, settling on this model right here. So we realized that there are some imperfections in the drawing and there are some better ways to make it easier for production or use. So we started to model things out in SolidWorks and create a another cardboard prototype to better show our concepts. So after adjusting and finalizing our design in SOLIDWORKS, 
we finally created our last frame design. So to create the frame, we sort of wanted to maintain the DIY mindset. So we built the first one ourselves. And uh, <laughs> it started off by cutting sheets of like polycarbonate Lexan, and then marking out the holes with a center punch, then drilling them in order to create weak points, which would allow <laughs> us to bend the frame with uh, less force than it would require to do so uh, than just doing it against a hard surface. So once we had the holes drilled, we used uh, both manpower and a little bit, a little help from a trusty mallet to uh, <laughs> create the first version of our final prototype frame. And I can pass this around, <coughs> let everybody see it. So once we created the forearm and the lower arm, we needed to find a way to attach it to the Alice frame. So that would involve both finding a support for the back and something to act as a shoulder. Because the arms wouldn't be any good if they weren't connected or if they didn't really carry weight. So we used a, uh, a piece of steel bar and curved it using a vise in order to <laughs> in order to shape it sort of in a, a kind of a yoke around the collar. And then for shoulders, we tested a variety of different methods uh, using uh, screws and clamps. Uh, we finally decided on using uh, steel ball joints from McMaster Carr. <coughs> So in the meantime, uh, after finding a way to bracket and combine the ball joints in order to better carry the weight uh, you're carrying on the frame, we remade the frame uh, two more times with both the arms, except in order to speed up the process, we might have cheated a little bit, we uh, used laboratory materials, uh, we used a metal brake, something that initially the DIY, uh, the average DIYer wouldn't have, but uh, we have proven that they can make it by other means. So once everything was attached together, we needed to find a way to make it move. So the joints were handled by a simple uh, polycarbonate bearing to just provide sort of a bicep motion joint. And then we attached the larger air muscles <coughs> here. And now we're going to show you how it works. You can see that it's contracting like how your muscle would contract. And then both arms work too. Scott, the lights on. Oh, you want lights? Yeah. Now we're going to turn on the lights so we can yeah, just give the audience a better visual of it. So the, uh, the bearings are a little stiff in order to keep the uh, arms from flopping around, but uh, as you can see, <laughs> with the press of the lever, they're able to, the muscles are able to yeah. lift the arm. And you may notice that they're place. Step. When you have weight on them, they'll be pushed back down. All right. So, after the frame was finished and it actuates and we know it works, we set about continuing our communication and interaction with the DIY community. So, to do that, we made a website. <coughs> Now on the website we are able to track our progress and sort of show people the steps we took and a little bit of background behind exoskeletons. So people are able to use these directions to sort of create their own home models and then hope with the final hope of creating sort of a community and a discussion about further improving and developing exoskeleton designs. As you can see here we have uh, a, a couple blog posts about background, the McKibben actuators, uh, some of the testing we had done. Good. Now, this was, uh, of course, not <laughs> without its challenges. Uh, the first one was sort of, as I had mentioned earlier, finding uh, a good range of actuation. We had tried multiple different bearing types until we settled on uh, just a general sort of centerpiece and a couple washers with a binding post in order to provide the best mobility. Of course, there's also fitting the frame, providing something that's more ergonomically shaped, 
So we ultimately settled on uh, sets of adjustable straps. So, and the Alice frame is naturally adjustable. So it'll be able to fit a, a fairly large variety of people. Finally, we had other things related to the McKibben actuators, such as sealant and leaking. And for that, the initial problems were caused by uh, poor sealant in the bolt side of things. So we eventually settled on the design which carried us through most of the project of sort of folding it over on one end to crimp the airflow and use a zip tie to sort of seal it off and make an airtight seal. But uh, for the larger muscles, we had used uh, caps that we bought at Home Depot that we drilled through and uh, sort of created a makeshift ceiling alongside uh, hose clamps. And then of course, you know, we made spares because <clears throat> from time to time so things will happen. Nylon will fray, mm -hmm. as, uh, as does this carbon fiber. And then, you know, you gotta make sure that it's properly sealed and covered by the sheath. Otherwise, the latex tubing will bubble out of the sheath and burst, like you see here. You like to pass it around? <laughs> And then our final challenge, which uh, we were not able to address by this stage in the pro process, was overall mobility. Because it relies on a compressed air and a set power source, it's, uh, it's sort of tethered. <laughs> it's tethered right now. And uh, with future hope, we'd be able to create more uh, portable component, something that you could carry on your back, a mobile power source, and possibly a mobile air tank for the, uh, for the compressed air. Finally, uh, as mentioned before, we there are future developments uh, for anyone interested in continuing this project. Some things we would have liked to do would uh, be incorporating EMGs and biosensors. We had a couple limit switches in order to uh, trigger ac actuation. But with the inclusion of biosensors and EMGs, you would be able to sort of connect it to your arm and connect it to an Arduino, which uses muscle impulses to control it, creating a more organic method of actuation. We also would have liked to try other actuator types, such as motors, uh, the spring power, and uh, pneumatic cylinders <coughs> as well. And then we would have liked to do additional tests. And finally, <coughs> We would try to, try to remove it from the uh, air compressor itself, sort of, like I had mentioned before, make it more mobile and make it be able to carry around the lab or home setting. Thank you. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Questions? Um, I, a few of us were late. We apologize that we typed out in the program. <laughs> Um, so I'm sorry if you said this at the beginning, but how much would this cost a uh, Joe average person in a garage to make? So this frame right here, huh. all of its components, without the air like without the air compressor, this would be under three hundred dollars. Okay, and is an air compressor something that's that um, the air compressors can range about hundred and eighty dollars and they're, they're not too expensive. They're a little bit pricey, but not too expensive. It depends on how high quality you get. And there's a variety of types of different air compressors. You could get large sort of sitting ones at a Sears or uh, a Lowe's, or you can, uh, if you want to try, you can use a portable, yeah. they have uh, compressed air canisters, which can be pumped up using other uh, larger or smaller air, compressor, air compressors. And it doesn't take too much PSI to operate this, actually. Uh, it goes, this, this muscle goes up to 6C PSI about. And put in perspective, that's like the about PSI of a two liter. Yes. Um, would creating this to be a more portable frame uh, kind of shoot up the price uh, drastically, or do you um, think it would actually still be rather low? I don't. It depends on how you do it. We, we've actually one of the methods we we're talking about making it portable is actually talking about using two liters, <laughs> which is very inexpensive. However, we have not tested whether two liters would leak and all the other factors to it. So depending on the kind of capacitor you would add to it, would be about the price. Yeah. 
The inclusion of a power source and a compressed air canister like you would find at, a, uh, at an industrial uh, storefront would likely increase it some, but not, nothing below, uh, nothing above $500. And for, as for the EMGs, they are also like thirty dollars for an EMG. Yeah, so for an RV, <coughs> uh, you can get some uh, simple biosensors for about thirty dollars. Uh, during your guys' testing of the the muscles there, did you uh, find a a max weight that it could uh, lift, um, or was that completely based off PSI applied? So we didn't do, get to do too many weight tests on, especially the big ones, mm -hmm. the uh, big air muscles. The smaller ones, we were doing them. A um, year or two back, and it was we were doing it. We stopped around 30 psi just because, or not 30 psi, 30 pounds, because it just wasn't really displacing any more weight. Mm -hmm. So it, it lifted uh, a weight, a large weight of about 32 pounds, uh, over about an inch to an inch and a half. And so does that mean that um, one of these muscles could actually overpower your own uh, human's capability and possibly cause injury, or is that? It could, it's relevant as in it could happen, or um, not so much based on your system here? At, at this time, uh, it is unlikely that uh, these muscles would currently overpower. This is sort of meant in a supplementary case. Cool. So it's able to sort of make a 30 pound object sort of feel like a 15 pound object. Cool. And with like pneumatic air muscles, the nice thing about pneumatics is when the air is exiting, you can control how fast it exits, you can control how slow it will go down. Any further questions? You mentioned um, the lag between regulation and technology. Yep. And I mentioned the case of drones. So proposing this to the DIY community, would you see any benefit in the DIY community trying to jumpstart the regulation process, and if so, how might they go about that? Um, for that, I would say for jumpstarting leg um, legislation, I would say would be a good thing ultimately because it would allow us to get a better hold on what is being created and the exoskeletons in general. How they would do that, um, I'm not quite sure, but if I were to take a guess, I would say contacting local senators possibly, maybe even talking with experts in the area on technology like exoskeletons. More questions? Thank you all for coming out today. <clears throat> and a special thanks goes out to Mark Showalter, Mark Starnes for letting us use the uh, machining shop, as well as John Wilde for uh, using the other engineering facilities, uh, Dr. T, Dr. Spindell, Dr. Bachman. Uh, Professor Hendrickson and Ms. Forshee for their uh, continued help and assistance through this, throughout this project. And all of the other faculty have been willing to, to listen to us. We've been putting up us. with us yeah. <laughs> throughout, <laughs> throughout the last four years. Thank you.